I don't think you. Um, uh, I don't think you know anything about England, did you? I mean, you, you were in Hereford, weren't you? First of all, I think you left Hereford when you were about seven years old. No, you? your research really sucks. Is it? Okay. Yeah. So I mean, I'm, I'm, I'd be embarrassed if I were you. Okay. No, I left Hereford when I was about six months old. Six months old, really? Yeah, my my uh, mother, my father was in the Dutch brigades, and he was in Europe and as a soldier and he wanted to have his wife away from the Blitz because she was pregnant. And so there was a place in Hereford who helped women who were pregnant. And once uh, I was born towards the end of the war there and once I was born, the war ended, my father came back and they moved back to Antwerp. So I was really about six months old when I left. So, and I apologize for really uh, degrading your research. I'm no, sure it's no, brilliant. No, no, I love having the research degraded. It leads to a far better conversation. Then, <laughs> then I was right. Okay, right. But listen, so tell me a little bit about, I mean, about, about your father. What nationality was he? So Dutch. where was he born? He was Dutch. Dutch. Okay. And your mother, Flemish, lapsed Roman Catholic? Yes. My mother was Flemish, born in Brugge, Bruges. And uh, she... Uh, got away from the rigid Catholicism that was uh, pressed upon her. I get, your dad wanted to get out of Europe. He wanted to get to America. It was a, was it, it was a sort of ambition of his, I, I, as I understand it, that Europe was too small. Exactly right. He, uh, your research is incredible. <laughs> I'm stunned I, I've by I've it. I've recovered. I've recovered. <laughs> I've recovered. Yeah, my father, after the war, tried for about four or five years to get visas for us to go to the United States. Finally, after many letters written uh, to get a job, because one had to have economic security of some sort, so the alien was not dependent on the government, uh, he found a job in Montana. And uh, he was a window trimmer, where, you know, where the, uh, and, it was, and a sign painter. So he would decorate the women's apparel stores and the mannequins and such, and paint signs. And I remember we crossed over about 1951, I was about five years old, uh, in a hurricane uh, on a boat. Um, and we landed, not Ellis Island, but we landed in New York. But we had to get to Montana. And my father didn't really have enough money for all the tickets. so. I remember, my brother remembers, he told me that my brother, who's a year and a half older than myself, and my mother and I were by the clock at Grand Central Station. And my father had paid tickets to Montana for three people, but he had no money for himself. And so I remember such an idealistic thing, my father was extraordinary. My, my mother said, well, what are you gonna do? He says, it's gonna be okay, it's America. And it's so sweet. And he hitchhiked from New York to Montana. And then we kind of lived in a shack. And uh, I want on. to, I mean, everybody knows you as uh, a puppeteer, whether we're talking about Sesame Street or Muppets or Star Wars or whatever. But is that, word, is, is that a word that, that you would accept? Because you're, cause you're, your mum and your dad, your mother and father, they were puppeteers? Yes, they were puppeteers in Belgium. My mother really made the costumes for my dad's puppets at that time. When they came to the United States, they really didn't do shows. They were socially involved and supportive of something called the Puppeteers of America. They did occasional shows, but it really it continued on supporting other puppeteers, doing costumes, things like that. I gather that your, that your brother and your sister weren't particularly interested, but this idea of, of working with puppets somehow suited you. you were, I think you were a shyer, rather more shy than your brother and sister? I was a very shy kid. I think I, was a, I had very low self-esteem. Um, I remember I would make things, uh, I remember in my mother and father's den where you watch television, I'd make a robot out of boxes and such. And I was never in love with puppeteering. I never wanted to be a puppeteer. But at one point I saw this old howdy doody marionette and it was not strung. 
And so I used this very thick string to string it. My dad said, no, that's not how you do it. Use fish line. And then I started doing that, getting interested, and then I worked at a place called Children's Fairyland in Oakland, California, a children's park where there was a puppet theater. And I kind of went there because I had fun and I was learning. But I, I, looking back on it, I think I was so shy that puppetry was a wonderful opportunity for me to express myself in a very safe manner because I wouldn't be rejected, I'd be hidden. Yes, yes, the puppet yes. would be rejected, possibly. So I think that's why I became a puppeteer. It was a safe way to express myself. I also <clears> want <throat> to know, I mean, there's, uh, I know there's, there's the vagabond puppets uh, yes. that you were involved with, run by... Uh, um, it was Lessie uh, Sh um, yeah. Schubert, wasn't it? Yes, yes that's right. Yeah. yeah. Now that was, I mean, she died, I think, around about 2004, some years yeah. ago. I mean, but she had a. Would a you write my biography for me? Yeah, she, <laughs> <laughs> she had a marionette show, uh, didn't she? Yeah. What happened? The vagabond puppets. Uh, when I was about well, 11 years old, 12 years old, I I was helping. Uh, I was learning, and I was enjoying working at. Children's Fairyland, as I said, it was a puppet theater there with three shows a day. And I would start making puppets and learning from people as an apprentice kind of thing. And I was doing that for a few years. And then when I was about 16, I think, um, I worked in the Vagabond Puppets, which was the Oakland Park Department in California. At that time, uh, had a trailer, kind of like a circus trailer, that was pulled by a, like a 1943 Buick that always broke down, uh, had a, a trailer with all multicolored designs. And we would go from playground to playground, two or three playgrounds a day, open up this thing, and it, it was a hand puppet uh, theater at the end, and it was a marionette theater on the side. I mainly did the marionette. We did one show hand puppet. And so there's... Um, you know, I remember one one image so, struck me so strong that I remember using it without knowing it in Little Shop of Horrors when I directed Little Shop of Horrors. Um, and Little Shop of Horrors uh, created an alleyway for Rick Moranis to walk down as he's singing. And as he's singing, he sees all these bums climb up the cyclone fence, very scary and very dark. And I realized afterwards that that image came directly from going to a particular playground in a very rough area. And as I arrived, all the kids, it was a, like a 16 foot fence, and all the kids were waiting, climbing on that fence, waiting for us. It was an extraordinary image. So I, I didn't realize, but that's what happened. I think this is the very first time you come across Jerry Jewell, who's going to be a writer for you. Yeah, Jerry Jewell, who uh, sadly passed away. Uh, I knew him when he was 12 years, when I was 12 years old and um, in Oakland, California. It, he actually was the head of the Vagabond Puppet Trailer, and we did a... I never went to the puppet uh, conferences. I'm, I, I, it, it, it's just something that I, I, I haven't done uh, because my interest wasn't puppetry. It just wasn't. Uh, but, I had to do, but I happened to do it. But Jerry Jewell was the head of Vagabond Puppetry, and he and I went down to a place called Asilomar, California, and I was 17 at that time. Uh, Jerry must have been in his early 20s. And I worked on two shows. One was uh, the present show that was appearing for the Vagabond Puppets. I was working with Jerry. Another show was, there was a contest called The Three Wishes. Whoever could interpret that three wishes best won. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I won that. but. At the same time who was there was Jim Henson. And Jim and Jane, I remember the first time seeing Jim was he was walking with Jane uh, with Lisa, who was like a, a year or two old, along the way with no, he had no beard. And at that time, I didn't know the Muppets other than there was some, these hysterical Calso commercials for seven seconds. They're amazing. So that was done by Jim Henson. And I didn't realize it at the time. But in any case, so I didn't know Jim, but Jim came to my show. And afterwards, he came and spoke to me. And um, uh, my, he said, oh, 
it was, it was a good, good show. You know, the, the, the ending. I think he needs some work on the endings. He's really low key, and he ended everything with monsters eating or explosions, and mine just kind of fell off a cliff. You were studying to be a journalist. I was. Right? Yes, I went to Oakland City College because I was not smart enough to go to Cal. All my friends went to Cal, and I'm an idiot at math, and so I couldn't get in at all. Uh, so I went for about six months there, and then Jim remembered me when he had to move to New York. At that time, it was Jane Henson, Jim, uh, Don Salin, who made the characters, and Jerry Jewell. But they were moving to New York, and Jane was pregnant again, and he needed another performer because Jane couldn't perform. So he asked me to come and try it for just part-time for six months. And essentially, the short story is I just stayed with him for 35 years. The story of you and Jim we, we're going to come to. I know how extraordinarily important that relationship was to you for a very long period of your life. But just going back to the sort of the craft, the technical thing, I mean, what was Jim doing? I mean, he was, was he using latex at that, at, at, at that stage? It, uh, were, Jim, his puppets, <clears throat> were his puppets different? Yeah. Jim's puppets uh, kind of exploded puppetry. There was nothing like it. Um, it's interesting. If you look at puppets today, and I'm not an expert on puppets because I, I don't, I'm not crazy about them. I'm really not. <laughs> Listen, you've never been crazy about them, or you you never wanted to do it in the first place. No, but, but you've done. But it. I, I love character work, and some of the puppets just wiggle. I mean, and and it, and they think it's good. Other puppets there are absolutely brilliant if you see the right ones. But I, I, I like great work. I don't care if it's puppets, or I don't care if it's acting, I don't care if, if it's a plumber fix a sink beautifully. You know, so, so I wasn't a fan of puppetry in general, I was a fan of good, really great puppetry. So Jim created a whole new form. Puppets used to be a prince, a princess, a king, a dragon, a story like that. And they each had personalities. And they physically looked the part of their personalities. Jim created characters that you could put a new nose on, you could put a new eye on, eyes on, you could take things off and on. Uh, he experimented in the beginning with hard puppets, but then he ended up being doing softer puppets with foam and, uh, and, and fabric covering. There was a more of a, 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 a organic feel to it. Uh, and so that was new. People didn't. People had cloth puppets, but not like this. And Jim made it so that these characters were more entities than characters. They didn't have to be a king or a queen or a. It was a an entity. And this stage, this is in commercials. This is in commercials. Almost this totally is in, in commercials. Sam and Friends in Washington D.C. But that's one thing that Jim changed: that the actual physical puppet. Had didn't have to have a a title. It, it was just it was just a, a thing that became alive. As a matter of fact, Kermit was never a frog. Kermit was just this thing. It's only later, and then people called him a frog that Jim accepted it as a frog. Oh, really? Yeah, it was never that. The other thing that Jim did was uh, when Burr Trillstrom was on the air with Kukla Fran and Ollie or other puppeteers, Bill Baird, were doing, they, also, they always had a proscenium. But what Jim did is he took away the proscenium and he made the television screen the proscenium. And he could do that because he decided to have a camera next to the camera shooting him, and the camera next to the camera would have a video feed to a monitor so he could see what he was doing, and therefore he knew where he was in that proscenium. And so he created puppets without a proscenium. He also, what he did is, because it was for television, the tight shot, the close-up, caused Jim and Jane to lip-sync properly. Before, lip-sync was maybe like this sometimes, you know? But because it was a close-up, and not a wide shot, because it was close-up, he made it so that one had to do all syllables and make it like that. So he kind of broke apart puppetry completely. And so it's interesting now, if you look at puppets on television, 
they'll be Muppets. But they become like Kleenex. When you think of puppets, you think of Muppets. Prior to Jim, they were puppets. Yeah. And they were hard, and they were kings and queens. So he broke it open completely. Because that voice thing was extraordinary. I, I mean, still, to watch now, I mean, to look at Rest Kermit, I mean, to see the ways in which slight, you know, little, slight little effect of strangulation or a slight little mister, the ways in which that can be conveyed is, 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 is still quite extraordinary. He was brilliant. He was a brilliant performer. Now, he, he, he was... I want to talk a little bit about his character, because he... <sighs> I mean, he, 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 he didn't lay down the law ever. He, he was much more of a guide, really, rather than a, a teacher. He wasn't an instructor, was he? He didn't say... I mean, when you were working with him, he's not saying to you, do it this way. How, how did the relationship... I mean, here you are, here is this man you admire enormously. I mean, from everything you've said already, obviously, you admire and you, and you recognise the difference in the things that he was doing. How was he with you? I recognise it now. I didn't recognise it then. I recognise that it was pretty damn cool, but I, didn't, I couldn't articulate why. The relationship with Jim and I didn't happen right away. I was 19. I was a kid. I went to the studio, which is 53rd and Street and 2nd Avenue in New York. It was that. And it was two rooms, that's all, the rare little flat. Just two rooms and a nook for a secretary. And in that place, when I arrived, Jerry Jewell was already there, who was a performer and writer. Don Celine was there, who made the characters, and Jim was there. And that was it. I think he might have had a secretary. So it was really the, four, uh, the three of them, and I joined, so it was the four of us. But I joined as the junior member. So I wasn't at a particular place where I could have a relationship with Jim because I was working for Jim and everything was new and extraordinary. It was only later, after years and years and years of doing hundreds of shows, flying everywhere with him, driving with him, we became very, very close like brothers and that's when I got to know him. But it took a while for that to happen. You, I think you've said somewhere that uh, perhaps uh, in those early days with him, you probably should have been fired, but uh, oh, yeah. or the, but but he, but he stuck with people. I mean, he saw things in people. He he stayed with them. He was very very loyal in a way to many story. people should have been fired. <laughs> uh, he was extraordinarily patient, and always saw the good in people. Always, uh, he was a very singular human being. Uh, he uh, he cared. Uh, about the quality of the work and if people really gave 120 percent he was very patient with them and wouldn't fire them because he knew they well they didn't do anything bad but they you know I mean I, I, I'd say I'd treat Jim like a father in the beginning because I was 19 and I had no right to do that he had kids of his own and everything and I, I would be moody and as a kid uh, I'm sure that other people had other things like that, nothing negative, but he was very, very patient. Yeah, and he did not ever tell us what to do. Never. He never said, do this. He just did what he did, and we went with it, and we learned that way. His death must have hit you very hard. He died when he was only 53, I think, yeah. uh, 1990. Yeah. 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 That was almost like a father dying. Yeah, father, brother. Yeah, yeah we were very, very close. And it was, uh, you know, if he'd only gotten to the hospital two hours early, he would have been saved. Uh, but this extraordinary, extraordinary vicious infection was too fast. Uh, and, uh, it was it was a terrible week. I suppose in those early days it, we were still talking about commercials. Um, I mean, the, the Muppets existed, but they were in commercials? Jim, at that time, even before I came, made whatever money he made on commercials, which is commercials being seven seconds long, 20 seconds long, 30 seconds long, a minute long. And, you know, I joined Jim after he'd done probably 100 commercials, and when I joined, we did a couple, few hundred commercials, from toilet paper to gasoline to coffee to luncheon meats to, I mean, that's how 
Jim, you know, did it. And Jim, <clears throat> Jim, you know, was a, a people don't understand. He was an experimental um, filmmaker and performer. He was he was really radical, and he 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 took that money and that he earned and paid the overhead. But he would always put it into research and trying new things and pressing boundaries. And it was only into, and when Sesame Street came that he could stop the commercials and work on Sesame Street. And Sesame Street is actually when the characters started forming. So it's not until Sesame Street came when characters were really created and had the opportunity to be created over a period of time. I mean, Sesame Street, as you say, was, I mean, was, was, was quite brilliant. But the the idea then began. I mean, that was a, an enormous success. Yeah, another John Syndicated Cooney. all over the world. I, I came yeah. across someone the other day oh, who said he had the Arabic rights to do yeah. Sesame Street. <laughs> yeah. and I thought it, it was an extraordinary thing. But it's still yeah, it's, still it's, going. People are still working. Some people are using that format. Yeah. Because it, you could translate it into other areas, couldn't you? You could have I think put that your was own children. Probably the idea at that time. I was just a hired performer, and so I just thought it was another gig. I thought, you know, I was going from, we were going from commercials to variety shows, and here we did this pilot for Sesame Street. I thought, okay, well, that's fine, and we'll go on another thing, and that kept on going, and yeah. it didn't end. And then, the, the, but you wanted, I think, Jim, perhaps you as well, wanted to do a, an adult show. I mean, wanted, wanted to do something which would... Well, it's not right to say me, because uh, as, much as, as much as Jim and I were a pair, and we were, he was still my boss. And... As much as I get the credit for working with Jim a lot, there were other people there that you don't know, from workshop people to performers to costumers to everything, that they really were part of it, and I was only a cog. I was an important cog, but I was a cog with everybody else. And so, but Jim was the one who actually made the decisions. So it wasn't right that. Jim and I wanted to do an adult show. Jim wanted to do an adult show. Jim was the visionary and went forward, and we just kind of cleaned up after him. <laughs> we just came forward. It, it's, it interested me, because I'd never known before. I hadn't realized that it was really, it, it, was, it, it, was, a, it, it was England that gave the breakthrough for the Muppets. Yes. It was Lou, Lou Grade. Because it seems a very brave decision to take. I mean, I know that you had that the Muppets had appeared, uh, Saturday Night Live, for example, right. had appeared there. I think the feeling was that they weren't quite right on Saturday Night Live because Saturday Night Live was a bit too caustic, a bit too... No, it wasn't that. Uh, we, were, we were on Saturday Night Live the first year, and actually Bernie Brillstein, who's passed away, all my dear friends have passed away. I hope you're healthy. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, Bernie Brillstein was Jim's manager. He was also manager of Lorne Michaels and also John Belushi and such. At that time, nobody knew John or Danny or Chevy or anybody. They knew the Muppets from, uh, from a lot of television appearances. So that was a little bit of a draw, and so Bernie booked us on there. Once we were booked on there, it was obvious that our sense of humor was a different kind of sense of humor. It's not that it wasn't caustic, because Jim did a whole new series of puppets, but rather that the Muppets humor is more punchy it's more energetic uh, and there's a kind of a second city casual sense of humor yeah. about, uh, uh, about Saturday Night Live and as a matter of fact the first year I remember the writers trying to write and J Jim wanted us to write but there was some situation where we had to have the writers which were Chevy at that time and other writers and it was very tense the writers meetings were very tense because they didn't understand what the Muppets were. And understandably, they were getting popular and this, they were thinking, can we just get rid of them and have our own show? Uh, and, and as much as, as friendly as I was, and we were friends with John Belushi and still with Danny and with Chevy and all those people, you know, they, it, was a it became a different show. That's all, it just grew up. And, but fortunately, I remember the last few shows, Jim took me aside and said, we just, we just signed for 24 half-hour, guaranteed half-hour shows in London with Lou Grade. Now, that's extraordinary. And high budget. That's extraordinary. Nobody gets 24 hours. Yeah, I think you have three episodes and now you're canceled. Uh, so the reason I was told that, in part, Jim did it in London 
was first of all economic because it was pre-sold to I think the five O and O's, the operate, owned and operated uh, station. So it was a pre-sale so they couldn't get too hurt if it didn't do well. But also Lou, uh, dear Lou Gray, had a studio ATV which was not being used. So he wanted someone there to, to use that. Nobody had any idea that it would be such an incredible hit. Extraordinary, and of course, I mean, there was a, there was a puppet of Blue Grade, wasn't there? Eventually, I think yeah, that you can use that puppet. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Which was now when let's talk about this. I mean, 120 shows in in something like five years, mm -hmm. writing and working the puppets. Um, what, what about the division of labour in this? I want to go into about matching the voices to the to to the characters. Now, I mean, you <laughs> you've described yourself already as an unwilling puppeteer, but of course, gradually, what's happening now is it's the voice is becoming important. We've talked about, you know, being unvoiced. I mean, at one time, you know, puppets are simply moving around to tracks that are being played. But now the voices of these particular characters, whether we're talking about... So something like Miss Piggy, uh, your voice now becomes enormously important. Uh, and, and we're going to go on to talk about the way in which your voices appear, the way people know your voice. It's become sort of synonymous with the characters. I mean, how does that bit start up? I mean, does it, what, what's the first time you do some voicing and what's the first time you realise that you've got a, a gift here as well? It's a completely different sort of gift, really. I, I, I hate to disillusion you, but you're wrong. The voices are not important. What's important is the combination of the physical character and the voice. The voice is only 10% of it. If you just had the characters and Muppet Show, uh, the voices, and Muppet Show is a radio show, there's no way it would have done so well. Because what I do and Jim did, or I did and I don't do anymore, and the other performers do, is exceedingly difficult but they do the voices as they do the puppets okay it's a very difficult thing for people to understand people talk about voices because the animated movies are voiced by celebrities so therefore all of a sudden it's about voices and it's not it's really about the three years those animators spent doing those images same thing with the puppets it's the character you create with movements, subtleties. You, it, you couldn't have any kind of character if it was just a voice. So the voice is only 10% of it. Let's imagine, we're talking about a, a typical Muppet show, and you're, you're getting ready, you're going to do it. And you, let's, just tell me, while it's going on, what you're doing. You know, what, what, what are you physically doing? What are you doing with your hands? What are you doing with your voice? What's, what, what's going on? I just almost want to, almost behind the scenes look. Well, the day of shoot, what we did, um, we had three days to record the show. One day with the guest star, two days without the guest star. Um, it sometimes bled into two days with the guest star, but nevertheless. Uh, and what we would do is we would be there early in the morning. We would do a rough rehearsal. Uh, we wouldn't put the puppets on our hands when we rehearse because it, they're very heavy, and so what we did it with, without, we, we did it naked without puppets. Um, and then when we were ready to shoot, put the puppets on, and Jim would guide us. Uh, he, he would, he would uh, we all knew what we had to do because we rehearsed it, whether it was music or dialogue. And then after the first take, Jim would say, you know, it's, it's okay, let's try it over here. And then I'd give a suggestion and say, this isn't working. And Dave Goles or Jerry Nelson would say, you know, I got a better idea over here. It was very collaborative, always. And Jim would listen to everybody and say, yeah, yeah, or oh, let's try this. So it was always collaborative. Everybody threw everything in, but Jim always kind of made the decision. You could sort of see at times the relationship in a way between you and Jim. Say, so look at the way with Kermit and Miss Piggy. You know, there's, there's the sort of way in which they're they're working off each other, oh, oh, which absolutely. perhaps sort of in a way, the, I mean, it was, was, the, was about you too, really. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Jim, <clears throat> no question. I mean, Piggy, when I created Piggy with the writers, um, you know, I created a, a very neurotic character. I mean, <laughs> she has layers of inner conflict, layers. Um, 
And that was me at that time. At that time, I had tremendous inner conflict for, with many things. Um, one of which I didn't want to be a puppeteer. I wanted to direct. Uh, but I was too scared to say it to myself. Um, Jim, on the other hand, always went with the flow. Always didn't go upstream, didn't paddle upstream. He always went with it, always went. And so that was our relationship in real life. And that tended to be our relationship in, uh, with the puppets also. You say it didn't to do with voice, but in terms of your career, I mean, when you get a call from George uh, Lucas and he says, okay, look, I've got this uh, character. I want you to come uh, along, the Empire Strikes Back. He, what he wants, he wants your voice, doesn't no. he? Does he, want <coughs> your, does he want your puppeteering skills? Yeah. Oh, he, he, wants, want he wants me to bring alive the character that he and Larry Kasdan wrote. That's what he wants. He wants something that transcends what's on the paper. But he doesn't want a voice. He doesn't know what he wants at that point, because that's never been done, first of all. But who invents, who invents the Yoda language? Who invents the language? The, the, Larry, the Larry and George wrote the language, but they didn't see it through all the way. And I asked George to, uh, if I could really hone in on the language, and he said, yeah. So I made it very specific and carried their idea throughout. Um, but, Laurie, the, the, this voice thing is, is it, 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 it's a red herring. Okay. Not for you, but for everybody. Yeah. No, it's good to hear. I mean, I, everybody. It's because, by the way, George didn't want my voice in the beginning. I gave him a tape. He said, no, thank you. And in post-production for about a year, I heard that he was auditioning voices for Yoda. He had no intention to use me for voice. And then I was on my honeymoon with my first wife about 25 years ago or 30 years ago. And he said, uh, Frank, maybe, could you come out uh, in Hawaii? Could you come out? And I think we'd like to try your voice. And so we, I flew back and recorded Yoda. So that's an indication of how little the voice is important compared to everything else. What he wanted to do was something he didn't know he could do. He wrote something down with Larry, a character, a small character. How do you bring that character to life? And that's what I had to do. I didn't create the character. Other people created it. George and Larry created the, the idea of it and the, and the dialogue. Uh, Stuart Freebound made the character with the help of Jim Henson. Uh, other people made the clothing. Uh, other people did the shots. What I did is I put it all together. And then I made something come alive. But you recognized the character. You, you, you brought, you, you, you conceived the character. I mean, yes. I, I put it together and I felt I knew that character immediately when I saw a drawing. And, and, and then I created a biography of that character and I I knew his likes and dislikes and everything about him. And so, um, yeah, he's, he, all my characters are very dear to me and Yoda is too. But, but it was, but, but as I said to you, I'll just make the point again, um, that that's an example how little voice, how, how voice is unimportant because it was never my voice we in the spent, first place. We spent a lot of time in this interview talking about all the things that you didn't want to do when you were saying that you wanted to direct. No, I, I, I want to give you some time to talk about that direction because I mean, you, know, you also, we got to... By we, the we, way, I loved my work. It's yeah. not that I didn't love it. I just want to do something else also. We should credit you uh, as an actor. I mean, you know, whether it I was... I don't uh, think so. Well, yeah, I mean, people still talk about that. Uh, there was the, I think it was the jailer in Trading Places, that little cameo that you did there. There was the American Werewolf, the bit in Blues Brothers as well, wasn't there? But, it, uh, but I want to get onto the directing, because time is, is short, but I wanted to credit that. Here you are, you, 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 you've done a bit of directing, I think, with... I mean, Jim put you into, into something in directing. It was a dark, dark crystal, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes, but that... <clears throat> I didn't direct that movie with him. Jim directed that movie. It was his vision. And this is typical Jim. We, I remember flying over to London with Jim, and he had been working on Dark Crystal for about a year or two before I came on board. And This was his attempt to sort of redo it like a modern Grimm's fairy tale, yes, wasn't he it? Yes, wanted, he wanted it. that texture. He was quoted as saying he thinks kids should be frightened. They should. He absolutely believed that. He believed that was a cathartic thing for ki kids. He, he didn't... Um, he didn't believe uh, in 
being safe to kids. Uh, you know, I uh, I remember this great story of Bruno Bettelheim, Bruno Bettelheim, the great child psychologist. He was asked once, uh, "What would you do with all the toy guns in the world?" And he said, "I would shoot all the educational toys." <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. And that's yeah. in a way, you know, it's good. This is part of our world. And so, in any case, I flew over with Jim after he'd been working for two years, and he said, he took me aside and he said, um, Frank, do you, do you want to direct this movie with me? Now, this is basically a $200 million movie, okay? And I said, what, Jim, I have never directed. How the hell can I direct? Why would you want me? And this is Jim, he says, because I think it would be better. And that's all I cared about. He knew that there were some shortcomings he had that I could fill. And all he cared about was make good product, good, uh, good work. Then you go on, Little Shop of Horrors. Yep. That bloody plant. I, uh, we uh, should uh, say this is the blood-eating plant, yeah. the plant that can only go on flourishing by consuming its, its owner and everybody around it. Yeah, and it was a massive project. It was shot in 007 stage, and uh, that was my third movie. But I suppose the one... That, 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 that sticks in my head, which is really a great movie, was 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 in and out. I mean, it was, oh, that thank was you. in 1997. That was Kevin Klein. That 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 was that was a brave, uh, important. It was a very yeah. very funny, but but it was a very tough film. And to combine those two things, a strong a strong message, but you were laughing all the way through. T tell me about that. I think I think that you had a you had a gay writer and you had a gay producer. I mean, perhaps one should briefly. Just say, just briefly tell me the plot of it so that people will be reminded. Well, uh, In and Out actually was based on a true occurrence that at the Academy Awards, one of the uh, winners thanked his gay professor, not knowing that the professor wasn't out. I mean, that was the basis of it. And that's the basis of the movie and the, and the repercussions of that. I think it was Scott's idea to go to Paul Rudnick, Scott Rudnick, Scott Rudnick, Scott, Scott Rudin, to go to Paul Rudnick and write it. And so Paul is, a, is brilliant. So Paul wrote it, and I um, essentially, you know, I made it. That's all. But it's, it was Paul's writing. But it was, uh, I mean, it, it, was, it was a gay movie. It was very dangerous which, at that which time. Which appealed to rednecks, though, didn't it? I mean, it, it, I, mean one, yeah. I always want, I'd love to see it in a cinema almost full of intolerant rednecks and see. Well, when, when Tom Selleck and Kevin Klein, Klein kissed, there were some, oh my God! <laughs> There's people from the audience going, no! <laughs> no. Uh, and I had them do it 36 times. There's a certain little theme of, about sending stuff up because. When I watched the Muppets, it was always in a way sending up American show business in a way. I mean, you know, here, you know, here, here was a show which wasn't working, and you know, you saw this sort of stuff on television every night, and you thought, well, oh God, this is crap. But here, it was being wonderfully sent up. But the next film that you make, I mean, the Bowfinger film that you make, is in a way you're not sending up show business; you're sending up filmmaking here. And you've got, you know, you've got Steve Martin, Eddie Murphy again. It's it's a bit, it's another send up, isn't it? It's so it is, but it's Steve's send up again. He, I work with these brilliant people, and Steve wrote it. And uh, I had a great time doing that. Um, it, w it reminded me of us when we began. It was the Muppets, me, Jim, just the four of us, Jim, and then Jerry Nelson, five of us, uh, and Don Sully. And, and it reminded me of the struggling little group of performers trying to make it. And that's what Bullfinger group was, these struggling little performers. Yeah. The only thing was, you know, is that the only thing stopping them from being successful is their complete lack of talent. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was, it was a ball to do. You are, you're, you're a modest man, because when I'm researching it, I kept coming across statements where you talk, you describe yourself as being low in self-esteem. You blame yourself on occasion. Very few people, people, you know, are very, very good at sort of defending themselves. But when you feel that you got it wrong, for example, I'm thinking of. Uh, Brando, I mean, directing Brando in a film called The Score, Brando's last movie of 2001, I think it was. When you 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 say, I, I got it wrong, I didn't quite get it right, and I think the same with the re remake of Stepford Wives. You mm -hmm. you 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 were quite self-critical and prepared to be publicly self-critical. I mean, people are prepared to be privately self-critical, but you've come out. I, I, I don't see it as blame. I don't see it as self-critical. I don't see myself as modest. Mm -hmm. I don't at all. I. I, I I hope I'm just saying what it, what it was. I mean, 
it's fine that I'm sitting here with you, Laurie, but the truth is one does not work in a vacuum. And certainly I am in success. I did not get here without Jim Henson next to me, Jerry Jewell next to me, there, you know, Dave Goals, uh, Don, there should be dozens of people sitting with me here. So I'm not modest, I am very good at my work. I'm excellent at my work, otherwise you wouldn't be sitting here talking to me. <laughs> I'm very, very good. I know I have a tremendous toolbox and somehow I've transcended characters to make them alive. I have no idea how, but I have done that. But I have not done it alone. And it really bothers me when people are interviewed and take all the limelight as opposed to taking the appropriate limelight. My limelight, appropriate light, limelight is I did a great job but I could not have done it with other people. That's not modesty, as far as I'm concerned. And as far as blame, it's not blame. It's, I'm the director. I accept the responsibility, yeah. Last question. And by the way, can I just say something? I want to make sure you, you understand. When I did The Muppets, it's not that I didn't like doing The Muppets. I loved working with The Muppets. I found it limiting not to be on the marketplace and doing larger things, that's all. But I loved working with The Muppets. How do you feel about Disney doing the Muppets then? Well, you know, it, it's it's difficult for me to respond to that without sounding um, a purist and a dinosaur. But but it's they're different. They're not has they're not the Muppets that Jim had intended. It's and the characters are done by the same people. My dear dear friends. And they do a great job, but they're very sweet now. Their job is to be rebellious. Their job is to say, screw Disney. They're cute. They're cute. To me, I love cute things like little bunny rabbits, but I don't like pejorative cute. These are too, they're too sweet. They're not, and the relationships, there's no conflict as much as in the relationships as there should be. The, the, that's what Jerry Jewell did so well when he wrote, and Jim, we, we all, we were all entwined like a funny O'Neill play that we all had chains to our chests and every time he moved it would, and that is fascinating and there was anarchy amongst that and it's become sweet and so that I, I feel sad about that at the same time I'm thrilled that people can see the Muppets again